Hi, I'm Danny, and this is a very special episode of Retro Camera Review because I'm going to be taking a look at this unique large format camera that used to be on this airplane, the SR-71. So there I was at the March Field Air Museum, one of the largest collections of airplanes in the West Coast. Personally, I was just there because, well, it's really interesting to see these giant hunks of metal people can throw into the sky and fly around. And also, my dad was a veteran from 20 years in the Air Force as a maintainer, so there's a bit of heritage in it for me as well. What I didn't realize, though, was that the museum actually had a pretty good little photography section in it that showed some of the combat photographer's tools. What made this trip really surprising, though, was the specialized airplane sitting in the middle of the room with a very high-tech camera on display, at least in the 60s high-tech. The Tech Camera, or TEOC, known as the Technical Objective Camera, was created by Hikon in partnership with Skunk Works as a reconnaissance camera that could give resolution up to six inches from 83,000 feet in the sky from the airplane. This was not your average film camera. To the best of my knowledge, only 36 of these cameras were ever made, and they were all made by hand. I find it funny to think that one of the best cameras ever made was not made for art. It was made for industry and war. Now you're probably saying to yourself, Danny, that doesn't look like a camera. Let me explain how it kind of works. Basically, you've got this uh, rotating gold bulgy thing, the mirror, right in front of the lens that points the lens essentially down at the ground. From there, you've got a big tube with electronics. The lens is permanently focused to infinity. And then you actually have the film holder bay, which shot about eight by 10 size film. And the speed of the photography was actually calibrated by the speed of the aircraft with the air navigation computer. Now they had two of the technical objective cameras, one that sat on the right-hand side and one that sat on the left-hand side, and they both went in one of these bays along with many other things they put in this airplane. The two tech cameras at each side of the bay were able to shoot at full nadir, which is just pointing straight at the ground, or 45 degrees outboard, which basically allowed them to photograph whatever they flew near. Now, if you wanted to take a portrait with this camera, that might be a little difficult. Because of the nature and use of this camera, it was focused permanently at infinity. So imagine telling your subject, okay, I need you to stand 80,000 feet over there so that you're in focus. Sorry about that. So I know it doesn't really look like I'm handling a camera lens, but essentially what I'm doing is I'm facing it from the left to the right here. And it would do that from about 15 miles up in the sky. Um, doing over three mock. So <laughs> it was a pretty, pretty customized system. I'm not sure what this gold coating is though. Boy, I'm glad you asked, Danny. I actually looked this up and it turns out that gold is used on a lot of things that possibly encounter a lot of heat and friction. And in this particular aircraft, the temperatures could reach over 800 degrees in certain parts. In fact, the cockpit windows were made out of quartz because if it was regular glass, it would have melted. So the gold on that part probably had to do with heat more anonymous electronics. <laughs> Out of curiosity, I asked my friend who used to work in the engineering field about how much it would cost to make all of those components in this, the electronic part. The components themselves might not have been that expensive. However, they did all appear to be hand done with acid etch techniques on the circuit board. But the main cost would have been research and development, he told me. Now I've got the top open. I'm pretty sure this part that has the little calibration sign on it is where the film would actually sit. So it would feed off of one of these tubes over here, these rollers, come up into here in this film plane, which is why it was calibrated. And then you have this unique little cog mechanism here with a slit in it. And what I'm pretty sure that slit was, was it's meant to go back and basically run down and expose a snippet of the film, one kind of roll at a time. So essentially it's like a flatbed scanner. Yeah, and I can see a drive motor down here that would, that would run it at a certain rate, depending on what the pilot would set in the cockpit, whether they wanted it um, at different speeds, which they had an option for, or they could just set it on automatic and it would determine it based on the um, airplane navigation sensor uh, computer or whatever it's called, that would feed that data into here. So, so what's, one of the things that's really unique about this camera um, with all this electricity and circuit board stuff on it is that basically a lot of its automatic operation is tied so tightly with the rest of the airplane that it knows exactly what's going on 
in that cockpit when it's on auto. The airplane's telling it, hey, we're going this fast. I need you to take this many photos at this time and I need you to compensate for motion blur by moving your lens or the film plane in a certain way. Uh, so it, it's amazing how like interconnected everything is on this airplane. It's, it almost has like a self-awareness of its own, uh, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> you know, as photographers, we're usually doing everything manual. I mean, a pilot has zero time to do any of that, especially when you're going over Mach 3. <laughs> you don't have time to deal with the camera or exposure. He's got like a center console on his right side where he can do most of that control. Because this was only one of at least three film cameras on the airplane, in addition to several electronic radar type sensors he had on there. Uh, pretty significant. This, this thing was just a giant picture taking machine, essentially. Like this thing is pretty crazy. <laughs> the amount of intelligence it could bring to everybody is pretty insane. It's one thing to be able to fly, and another to be able to take photographs. But to be able to do those both while getting shot at and having the responsibility for over $33 million worth of titanium metal, it takes a particularly capable person to do that. Looking at all this, it definitely makes me feel pretty grateful that we have people that are actually able to do this kind of thing and that are willing to step up for us. It really just makes me want to say thank you. Or whatever I was just saying in that shot. When I was doing research for this video, I actually came upon a video of Brian Scholl, a retired SR-71 pilot, who's actually really into photography and talks a lot about how important it is to take chances when you're photographing. So it's actually a very photographer-specific video if you want to check it out. So thanks for watching, and I hope that you gained a little bit of interesting info from that because uh, not many people get to interact with camera pods like that. Uh, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up or just walk away from your computer. You can do anything you want to do. Anyways, thanks for watching. See you later. So if you're ever in the Moreno Valley in California, which is about 70 miles out of LA, make sure you stop by the Marchfield Air Museum. It's really one of the most impressive museums I've ever been to. And if you're an aviation buff, you're going to have a good time. Just bring your walking shoes, because it's huge. Ha-cha! <laughs> Ha-cha!